Hallo zusammen, willkommen bei dem Panel, Gespräch, Treffen zum Thema Designs, Patterns in Hackerspaces. Zuerst mal die Sprache. Wir haben den Mitch Oldman da. Wäre es okay für euch, wenn wir das auf Englisch machen? Very good. So, welcome to this panel on the topic of design patterns in hackerspaces. Um, first, I would like to do a small show of hands. Who here is a member in uh, hackerspace? <laughs> or a fab lab or something like that. Don't have to narrow it down that far much. Okay, and who has kind of more of a leading role or something in a hackerspace, like implementing design patterns? Okay, that's slightly less. Um, as I take it, Tony asked a lot of you guys to come and share some stuff, so might please the people in a leading role of, of a hack center come to the first row, if that's okay for you? Yeah, perfect, guys. Thanks. It's just so that uh, my friend Stephen here, who's going to be running around with the microphone, doesn't have too far to run. Um, so we could have made made this talk like be like a really frontal thing, like with having Mitch here and having Tony here both like with their like decading experience, no, like going, getting into decades of experience in like one noise bridge and open Velo sense being hacker spaces where they are carrying a, or acting out a leading role. Um, but we thought it might be better for everyone or more interesting if we could like keep this more like a talk between peers where people could talk about their issues they have in their hacker centers and like what design patterns might help solving these issues. So first I would like to ask like, are there any things like you have experienced in your own hacker center where you like would like to ask someone else how they solved it or, or just like that so we could like establish what, what are the things that you're curious about, what you want to know about and then we could like go through them one by one. Anybody? Of course. Uh, oh, and wait, just before you ask your question, there's one thing I have to tell everyone. Uh, this is all being filmed, if that's okay with you, and it might be publicized. So if you don't want to be on camera with your face, you can just like talk through the microphone, then you're off voice on video. And if you want to present yourself, you can also come here on the stage. Um, <laughs> okay, so. My question is about how to kind of, s how do you solve the little things that, the, the same things that trip you up when you flat share, like who takes out the trash or who has to wash the dishes if basically the person who is responsible for making a mess doesn't clean it up. And, and in a hackerspace, because there's a lot of people, it's, it's harder to find out who it was, so yeah. Okay, th yeah, that's a good question. So let's just like summarize that as like all the little things and housekeeping or something like that. Yeah, yeah. good question. Go ahead. I have a question. How you handle uh, like membership fees and sponsoring? So uh, do other hackerspaces try to cover all the costs of the, of the room by membership fees to make it self-financed, um, no matter how high they're going to be? Or do you try to keep the fees very low by accepting sponsorship? And if you do, who do you accept? Okay. So let's call that like financing. Yeah, basically financing and funding. Anybody else? Are these the only two questions? More will come up. I guess. Yeah, so, yeah. Oh, you have another one? <laughs> yes. Um, as a hackerspace, a lot of people are kind of sensitive to using social networks like Facebook, for example. 
And so how do you advertise your hackerspace in a, let's say, privacy friendly way? Yeah. Because a lot of the options that everybody else has aren't really an option for a hackerspace, I yes. think. So like social media with privacy friendly social media. Yeah, okay, as we only have these three questions, why don't we just go through them and we'll see like if someone else or something else comes up. Okay, so first a uh, question about like the little things and housekeeping. Um, <laughs> I see Tony wants to give the mic to Mitch. I, I guess that's because uh, there's like a certain rule set on uh, design patterns for hackerspaces or something like So like everything uh, we'll be talking about today, there's no right way to do anything. There's definitely wrong ways, uh, but the wrong way is what doesn't work for you and your community. So this, this uh, question about what, how to take care of all the little things, because the little things are what uh, really freak people out in a community, whether it's uh, flatmates or uh, a hackerspace. Um, if people don't take responsibility for what they do, that leads to tension. But no matter what, community is hard work. And if any of you have ever been part of any community in your entire life, you probably know that none of them have been easy all the time. And there's times when it's really difficult. One of the things that can make things difficult is if some people feel that they're doing more than everyone else. Some people seem to go out of their way so that they're always doing more than everybody else. <laughs> um, and that can be problematic behavior as well. But the whole idea of design patterns, it's not rules, it's patterns. What, what has worked and what hasn't worked so well for all of us in our experience? And then we can share those. And just because it works well, what we've done at Noisebridge works well for us doesn't mean that it will work well for you and all of your spaces. But we can share those experiences, you can, we can learn from each other. And hackerspaces, as they've been popping up around the world, we've always been helping each other, which is why we continue to grow exponentially around the world. So with that kind of background, Noisebridge, I can share an experience with Noisebridge. We're, um, all hackerspaces are unique because they're started by unique individuals and they uh, have unique characters in different parts of the world. Noisebridge is unique in that we are a bunch of anarchists, explicitly anarchists. We have no leaders. We only have one rule and that's be excellent to each other. It came from a bad Hollywood movie, but it works for us. And we really do have no leaders, but positions of leadership do form. And anarchy, as we see it, is people self-organizing to make cool things happen. So if anything's gonna happen at Noisebridge, it happens because people self-organize to make that happen. And around the world, hackerspaces all have some form of that called duocracy. Things happen because people do it. Not because people are the best at it, that's meritocracy if that works. And not because people vote on it, democracy, but duocracy. You do it if you think that no one will object and um, you can get the help you need by other people if you need help to do it. And that's how, and if you like it, you can do it more. If other people like it, they'll encourage you to do it more and you can get other people to help and everyone gets good at it then. How do you get good at keeping a communal space tidy and organized and clean. But what does that mean? Like if a whole bunch of people in the community, all the people in the community are total slobs and they're totally <laughs> fine with big piles of shit everywhere, fucking A, great. You've got a great community and you've got piles of shit everywhere and everyone's happy. If you've got a kind of community where everyone is totally type A anal and wants everything totally in its right 1K resistor drawer and the pliers go here with an outline around it and the screwdrivers are all in order and you definitely don't want a Phillips over here because that's for the flatheads. You know, whatever, if everyone's like that, it all works. But it's rarely that way. There's usually slobs mixed with uh, control freaks. Um, so we have to work it out. At Noisebridge, 
what we've found is people gravitate to an area, whether it's electronics or the sewing and crafting area or the biology area, whatever, we have all these different areas. People gravitate towards that and some people are always taking a sense of propriety of those and are the people who rise to a position of leadership to make sure things are as tidy as people want. And um, as long as they're respected by the people in that area, they keep being uh, the point person for that. We get a free light show. <laughs> I was late because I put up my tent right before running here. <laughs> But other hackerspaces, someone um, volunteers for a position and they hold that position for a period of time. Some hackerspaces, they're voted into it. Um, so what have you tried for your community? What's worked and what hasn't worked? Uh, I'm from the CCC ZH Zurich and uh, I think at the moment it's, um, for the large part, the, the, basically the, the cleaning tasks are, are done in a sense by volunteers. So uh, I think it's, it's just a natural thing that, that some people kind of have more of a sense of ownership over the space. And I, I don't mean that in a negative way. And then those are the ones that have then a stronger uh, drive to keep it tidy. And so there are certain people that just clean more up, uh, clean up more because it's more important to them that the hackerspace is tidy. But at the same time, also it kind of fatigue sets in if, if those people have to keep cleaning up after others and it, I feel the tension building in, in my hackerspace a little bit and that's why I want to find a way to kind of diffuse this situation. But uh, yeah, I don't think it's, it's really, let's say, institutionalized in a way that it, it's assigned who does what in, in terms of cleanup jobs or, or even just kind of that it's clear who we have to show appreciation to for the clean space. I, I guess there's a bunch of people who don't really pay attention. I mean, I feel I, I know like the three or four people who are the ones who do most of the cleanup, but yeah, I, I don't know if that's clear to anyone that it doesn't just happen to be tidy magically. <laughs> And we do have a dishwasher now, so one of the big cleanup jobs is kind of taken care of. <laughs> um, my, I don't know what to say. <laughs> so you, you brought up, uh, you know, some people are doing, um, basically three people are doing all the tying. So those people start getting uh, maybe burned out resentful for the other, other people who aren't and they're feeling like they're doing more work than other people and that's not a sustainable situation. So what are the other people doing that they're doing more of than the people who are doing tidying up because while they're tidying up they don't have enough time to do all the other things that those other people are doing. And what happens when someone feels there's something not working for them? Do you have conflict resolution uh, means for conflict resolution in your community? Is it just ad hoc? Someone just can't stand anymore and then they scream and yell at each other and then you have to apologize? I mean, that's one way to do it. <laughs> so what happens when someone is feeling frustrated? Is there a way for them to address that? I know it's at, 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 at Noisebridge we have, if someone um, uh, feels like it can be of use, they put a sign up like the magic fairy does not come here and tidy up after your mess. Please do that yourself. <laughs> Something like that. But uh, conflict resolution, I mean, if there is one or more persons in a room, there will be conflict. You deal with that when it happens. So all of us have been in community. What do you all do when there's a conflict? Or we, better yet, what do you do when you feel like you're frustrated that you can deal with that situation before a conflict arises. And there's all sorts of ways to do that. 
Yeah, so what you can do is get everyone together and have a public shaming ritual <laughs> against that person. In my experience, and unfortunately I've been in a community where that happens, it doesn't work too well. <laughs> I don't think that works too well in anyone. You can have a public pillory. Is that English word? It's where you uh, uh, chain someone to the middle of a town square so they can't leave and everyone knows that they're the bad person. Um, that doesn't seem to work too well either. But you know, what works well for one community, again, might work not so well in another, and what works um, not so well here might work great there. So what, what can you do for conflict resolution? What can you do to alleviate frustration before it becomes problematic? So, I'm Michael, hello. I'm from Lux area. We are placed in Lucerne. And we also had this problem with the cleaning up. So, we are using the rooms from a school. And we got the feedback the, that there is a lot of mess after we meet each other in this room. And we started to say each other, hey, Clean up your mess that you produced before you leave the rooms. And this just didn't work. Because everyone did um, clean his place up, but there is always some dirt around you. And this wasn't cleaned up, and we still got this fat, bad feedback. And then we started to, to say, OK, if this doesn't work, we still say everyone is cleaning his place. But before the last person is leaving the room, he makes a control check. And for, for us, this, this started to work. It seems to be clean. But we still got this bad feedback. And then we just started to use uh, another room in the school and we still got the feedback the room wasn't cleaned up which we used before so it's what just an accuse um, I went to the teacher in the next morning on the day we didn't use the, the room and asked him was it okay this time and he accused us still, hey, there was a big mess, it it's smelled from our food and these things. And then ask him, what do your students do in the morning? Do they eat breakfast or did they order pizza for, for breakfast? And then he realized that he was still in the mood of accusing things. And, um, he was accusing your group. Yes, yes, for just something else. And since then we had clean rooms, everybody is tidying up, and we didn't get any bad feedback. Um, okay, so well, let me let me just uh, continue on. So, all co all communities ha are people have people in them, and people all have issues. And sometimes people get angry. Sometimes people are happy. If a whole bunch of people or two people are upset Sorry. at each other at the same time, it can be a mess. What happens in in your communities when people have oh, conflict please. with each other? What do, what do you do? Do you have um, procedures to follow or do you just like let people work it out amongst themselves combinations what what do people do in their communities when there's conflict I'm also from uh, case computer club Zurich as as him and I can at least contrast to um, uh, two ways uh, I tried to, to address uh, uh, it, it was the same issue uh, about a mess after after 
um, our, our weekly meetings, um, we have that concept of a, I don't know how to translate it uh, really well, a Beschlussfähiger Chaos Treff, which is uh, at the same day and at the same time as, as a normal, normal group meeting, um, but uh, which is announced, I think, five days in advance and which also has some, some ability to decide stuff. And uh, this can be, be announced by any member. And uh, it, it is kind of a way to um, g get people together and maybe it will only last like half an hour and then the, the normal, normal meeting will, will, uh, will uh, follow where people do, do their own stuff. And it, it can be used to um, address anything that, uh, that, it, that you think needs, needs the attention of everyone, at least for, for a short period. And I think we're not doing, it, doing these kinds of meetings uh, enough. Um, uh, because uh, at least for me, when I see uh, an issue, something that I think that that uh, where I feel kind of powerless uh, about something that that I'm not okay with, I uh, I think at least for me it it helps to at least have a way to tell people that that I see this problem, and most of the time uh, this will even result in in at least. A part of a solution and this is like one way and I think we should do that more and uh, the other way that I tried was was um, um, trying to get the same information uh, uh, across but uh, on a mailing list uh, which we also have where every member is subscribed or even more people uh, and with, where I think uh, even more people read that mailing list that uh, uh, normally attend uh, uh, such a meeting and um, there is from my experience absolutely no productive feedback if the initial message is uh, is of that kind of I'm not okay with that situation and uh, uh, because it, I think it comes across as, as just accusing out into the blue and th this is th uh, this is a contrast that, that I feel is, is very strong, and I think it's very important to uh, find the right channel to um, uh, tell people what what your view of the situation is. Okay, you got one more point, Mitch, or go ahead. So. <clears throat> We um, have a really large community at Noisebridge. There's hundreds of people who come through every week. And um, we started off with 54 members, and it only grew from there. Um, so it, uh, there were a bunch of interpersonal problems that would arise with a group that, that's, that is that large. Um, we found that on an email list, um, it just was uh, people arguing like they were on the internet or something. Uh, so, um, let's see, there's, um, well, let me, let me, s yeah, so we formalized, we, we came up with a f somewhat formal procedure. So if, if there's, like, if, if you have a problem with me, it's up to you to come to me and let me know because I might not know. If you think that I do know and that you're afraid to approach me, then we have our website's a wiki. So there are a whole bunch of people who have volunteered as mediators and they put their name on the wiki. And so you can go to someone who you think is cool and say, can you talk to me and that Mitch guy? He's a bummer for me now. And so we can all get together. Or if you're feeling like it's really unsafe and you don't even want to be in the same room with me because I'm such a dick, um, then the mediator can talk to you and then come and talk to me. Um, if it's, and then once that happens, it's up to the mediator to uh, see, well, well, you know, it seems like you're being totally upfront, but that Mitch guy, he seems like he's really defensive and he's not really copying to, he's not really taking responsibility for his part in this. So it's up to the mediator to go around and just discreetly just ask some people if there's anyone in the community they feel like is not really behaving excellently. Um, that's our one rule, right? So um, they, they, and then they might even name a name if they feel it's safe to do so. And then they're looking for a pattern. It's like, wow, you know, you had this problem with that Mitch guy, and this guy had a problem with the Mitch guy, which is sort of similar, and so did two other people. Now that's a pattern that 
I need to, someone, someone needs to tell me like something's going on and my behavior needs to change. And if it's something easy like just cleaning up after yourself, that's probably pretty easy to resolve. If it's something that's more of you know, like a, a personal issue on my part, well, maybe I'll be able to change my behavior without being disruptive to the group and maybe not. Um, if I'm willing though, and it's not so disruptive to the group, then, um, and I change my behavior, then things proceed. On the other hand, there are people who come to Noisebridge with a large open community, this happens, uh, who are sociopaths. And they won't change their behavior even if they say they will, and they seem to get a lot of juice out of a lot of negative attention. Um, those people, we um, give them a few chances, and if they don't uh, change their behavior, they get put on our, what we call our 86 page. Because in the United States, if a restaurant takes something off of its menu, that's called 86. <laughs> So we have an 86 page, and if you ever want to see some totally bizarre human behavior, you can read through our 86 page. You got some examples there? Like, you really write down what those people did, or? Well, so most of the people on there are because um, they're incredibly uh, terrible, like, they go to Noisebridge to hit on women. Oh. So that's not excellent. No, not at all. Okay, so flirting is totally part of human behavior, and flirting's fine, but if you go to Noisebridge to flirt, that's not really that's cool. weird. Yeah. Um, but, you know, someone stealing, someone threatening violence. Um, uh, yeah, there's some bizarre things as well. Um, <clears throat> there's a famous uh, episode of someone who claimed to be a Buddhist monk setting up a shrine. <laughs> 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 that was written up on Boing Boing. So anyways, if, if you have a large community or even a small community, sometimes you get some really interesting stories that you can tell people later. <laughs> yeah, there was someone sleeping on top of the elevator. So uh, this, is, this is an aside now. This is just an amusing anecdote. But um, uh, we've been around 10 years. We're going to have, uh, in September, a 10-year anniversary exhibition and ball. So a ball is a dance. So we're going to have a big dance with music and, uh, and demos and talks and all these things. What we're going to do also is have historical plaques where some of the more bizarre things that ever happened in Noisebridge are, uh, are commemorated. So there will be a plaque saying, uh, it was thought, uh, it was on this spot in uh, uh, December of 2014 where someone was caught living on top of our elevator. <laughs> It was rumored that five, up to five people at once were sleeping in the structure that was formerly known as the DJ booth. Um, uh, up to five people were sleeping here at any given time uh, who weren't welcome at Noisebridge, things like that. So anyways, we've got plenty of, of, of stories like that. But um, an email list is definitely not the place to work out problems with emotional content. So I'll just say that categorically. Um, there is one pattern uh, from the original design patterns, uh, and th those original design patterns, if you haven't read them in the last couple of years, I I'd recommend going and revisiting them. They're really good to reread every year or two, because there's a lot of fantastic information there for keeping a community running smoothly. And not everything there applies to you and your community, but it's worth reading anyways. One of the design patterns, though, is have a meeting every week. And we'd revisit that at Noisebridge uh, periodically, because some people are like, ah, oh, we go over the same stupid things every, every Tuesday. Uh, maybe we shouldn't do meetings anymore. And we always end up having, continuing the meeting, because like, just once a week for people to have the opportunity to come together, even if everyone doesn't come, just having that opportunity, knowing it's a place where you can just come and say, hey, hi, how's it going? Or you, can, you know there's a place where you can just say, this place is a fucking mess. Can't people clean up after themselves? Maybe just a little better. Um, whatever. Having that opportunity and for people to introduce themselves who are new to the community and for people who are new to the community to see how the community runs itself. Um, but what we found at Noisebridge is that the weekly meeting is not 
the place to work out interpersonal problems because then the meetings become a place that no one wants to go. And the meetings just get uh, derailed into personal stuff that really shouldn't be uh, taking up everybody's time. So um, if people have interpersonal stuff, we have that formal process that I outlined earlier. Okay, so thank you, Mitch. Um, if I may summarize this topic, like you had, we had different like solutions to this problem of housekeeping and keeping your thing tidy, and uh, which resulted very quickly in not just that topic. It's more of a thing about like how do you um, how do you act upon like conflicts, conflict resolution patterns inside of your hackerspace. And we heard that you at Noisebridge do that through giving people like self-organization and giving people a sense of ownership also for their small realm and leadership and stuff like that. Um, let's go to the next point on our agenda. That would be finance and how do you finance your hackerspace? Do you like do it as flat as possible and external financing or funding, or do you do it all through the membership fees? Um, that was your question. I don't remember the name, sorry. Danilo, Danilo right. Um, I'm guessing you asked that out of a certain reason, right? Yeah, the thing is that uh, we used to be, we're still a pretty small hackerspace in the Opusville core dump. Uh, Right now we're 28 people uh, and maybe 10 uh, come by every week, depends on the week. And uh, we used to have a very small room with just 16 square meters and uh, we ran out of room. And then we had to switch to a different room and we're looking for different options, but uh, it still comes down to uh, around a thousand bucks per month uh, costs that we have every month and do we need to cover these somehow. And um, Originally, my approach was to try to cover as much as possible with membership fees because then we're not dependent on anyone else. Um, nobody can influence us, etc. But the thing is that then uh, the prices get um, high enough that people think that they don't really want to become a member because it's too expensive and they don't uh, come by as often as uh, they would want to. And then on the other hand, um, if it's too cheap, then you have to find a lot of external sponsorship. And then also, if you look for sponsors, which is what we are doing right now, then what kind of companies do you ask? We asked the city, which didn't work out, which would have been pretty nice because then you're kind of independent. But uh, if, if that doesn't work out, do you start asking uh, like any company that would give you money or do you choose between companies with a different uh, specific approach or do you just look for local companies? And uh, yeah, these kind of questions would be interested in how other hackerspaces are doing this. Uh, maybe one small remark, uh, since you said you asked the city, maybe you can ask them for uh, cheaper rent in a place that the city owns instead of asking for money directly. So at least, for example, in Zurich, I think about 30% of the properties are owned by corporations or the city. So there's a lot of places that they could basically give you cheaper rent and in fact that's well that's the situation for the etc at the moment now can I ask Tony something about this I mean as far as I know you organize these workshop things and stuff like that is that one way you part finance your hackerspace or could you tell us something about that maybe in the past, we had a very low rent, mm -hmm. 50 francs per month. <laughs> <laughs> and in the future, we plan to, to do events. Yes. To do events that you charge for? The charge. Uh, where you get, you collect money for people who want to come to the, they have to pay entry fees and... Yes. Okay, so th those are going to be like workshops, soldering and stuff like that? Yes, or parties or... 
Okay. Something. I'm guessing land parties. <laughs> Example, yes. <laughs> we also tried to um, start some projects that could give us some money. So one of the approach was uh, we're working, up, working on a project where we distribute water temperature sensors in the lake and then try to find a sponsor for every sensor with the idea that we have an app where the sponsor is listed next to the sensor um, with, the, with the goal to get some um, stable income. And there were some like uh, sponsorship possibilities or uh, like um, shops that um, that sell maker stuff or stuff like that that we ask and they would have given us a one-time uh, payment or something like that, but that's not sustainable. So maybe also projects where you can get some uh, like regular income would also be an option to reduce the fixed costs. Uh, yeah, we're still it's one of these typical projects that takes forever. So uh, right now we found someone that would actually pay for one of the sensors, but they're not done yet. But maybe that's also going to help some people. And also, actually, this month we tried to start our f uh, first workshop. Um, and we tried to, it was about uh, cryptocurrencies for total newbies. And we tried to advertise, advertise it in the local supermarket. But uh, we didn't get any, um, any sign-ups. So either it was too expensive or uh, we didn't, um, like... Yeah, maybe we didn't put a good explanation next to it, or maybe it was the wrong place. So we're still experimenting. Any other people have different ways they've made uh, money, income from their uh, space? Um, well, I don't think it's the case at our space currently, but uh, one uh, idea is also to uh, sell beverages at a bit of a higher price than you, you uh, buy them. Uh, to try to make some money. Uh, it's easier for a small space, uh, which doesn't have to deal with legal issues that th this, this brings with it. Um, yeah. I want to address the point of being independent of any company, and I think that's a really important factor. And in our hacker space, we are in the lucky position that the rent in the, the house we, we are in is very low, and I think we found a pretty good solution in that we keep the membership fees as low that we can cover at least the rent with those membership fees. So if any sponsor would uh, not uh, sponsor us anymore in the next year, for example, we would still be able to run the hacker space. We wouldn't have all this cool stuff we are able to, to buy right now and to provide to our members, but at least we have the space. So in this case, we are independent from sponsors as we won't go bankrupt if any sponsor leaves, but we are still able to have a very nice income for, so to say, from sponsors, which really helps us out. So we can keep our membership fees uh, quite low this this way. I'm from Toolbox Bodensee from Markdorf. Uh, as I talked before, we are using rooms from this cool, and there we um, have very small rents, which we can pay with with our uh, membership fees. Um, so it's a kind of sponsorship from from the school to us, and there is a kind of dependency for us to them to to their rules and. Uh, let us say the political meaning of their stuff in charge, but we are trying to hold this uh, very low. But uh, even though there was mentioned to sell beverages uh, to to get some money, and we exactly did this not with the idea to gain money, to just to have uh, mate on our space and. It was always um, right, that someone was um, getting mate from a supermarket. Then we had a pot where people can throw in money and we um, told uh, how much it, it sh they should put in. And it worked very well at the beginning, but more and more there, there was just less money in the pot. So then we... Uh, we told the people, hey, maybe you forget to, to pay your remote and then they go to the pot and put some uh, extra money in and 
it seemed to work uh, a little bit longer. But at the moment, we don't know that there is a, let us say, a leak of money. We, we don't know if someone is stealing or something else happened. We, we don't want to accuse anything uh, at the moment, anyone. We're just trying to find out what happened. If, if someone maybe just put the money away to, to save it. Um, but be careful with, with this idea. It's the f fair use does not always work in, in the community. Maybe first to address the issue with uh, like sponsored locations or something like that that you get for cheaper. In our case, it might have been possible to get a location that we could use maybe once a week, uh, similar to a school, but that wouldn't be an option for us because we want to have projects that you can keep in the room, and then it's not really something that you can do. And uh, in our city, there's not enough. Uh, like I can imagine that it's easy in Zurich, but uh, that wasn't really an option for us. Then the thing that was mentioned about the drinks, beverages, is actually one of the best income uh, um, ways for us. And we decided, at first we had very low uh, price, we just had uh, one franc for uh, any beverage. And then we decided to increase the prices to, right now it's 250 Swiss francs, and if you go to a bar and buy a beer, it's usually five to six. So it's still much cheaper to go to the hackerspace to drink something than to go to a bar. But um, it still gives us uh, quite some income over the months because basically every night you're there, you drink something. And uh, that worked really well for us. And uh, we also have a cash box where people just put in something, but we have a price list, um, which I think helps because if you just say put in something, then some people are not going to put in anything because they think it's kind of optional. Um, and others put in too much, and uh, that's not really a good situation, so we just fix the price. Um, yeah, and we didn't have any issues with the money um, uh, getting lost or getting stolen so far. So we, we <laughs> or we didn't notice, but there was still enough left. And there was also uh, there was some guy that uh, always got the beverages from the supermarket, and for example, he decided to just buy them as a sponsoring, which is also uh, one way um, that uh, like a member can say, well, I'm going to buy these things from my own money, uh, and it. For, for one beverage, it's, it's really not much. So it's kind of a nice way to sponsor it without you actually noticing much because you just go to the supermarket, buy some drinks and bring them to the space. Okay, can I just interrupt you for one yeah. second? I mean, we, st we have five more minutes and we still have one question out. Like, do you guys want to stay on this topic or do you want to like have a really crappy short version of the third question probably? Uh, Sorry? You want to stay on this one? Or? Oh, so you're doing the next talk and you will be okay with like postponing a bit? Yes. Okay. Okay, but so then let's do like maybe 15 more minutes on the next question. Is that okay for you? So let's just like shortly summarize this one. We had different possibilities like uh, getting a cheaper space through the city or something like non-financial funding through like organizations of the state and non-state. Um, financing yourself through selling beverages and yeah and some things that weren't mentioned uh like selling t-shirts this is the t-shirt for rev space it and they made a bunch of money on that um and at noise bridge whenever we've whenever we go below so three months of operating expenses in the bank uh, I was the first treasurer, so I made sure that if we ever dip below three months of operating expenses, people freak out. <laughs> and um, that's a good time to freak out rather than when you're going to not be able to pay rent, right? So uh, whenever that happens, we have a, um, a party. <laughs> <laughs> Sell more beverages. <laughs> Uh, well, we have a, a, you know, all we need is a box saying, welcome to Noisebridge, suggested donation $10. And then a person sitting there smiling. 
<laughs> nope, and that's all it takes. And actually, there's been studies, if you have a person where the money is, then uh, people are much more likely to put it in. And also, if you just have a picture of a person <laughs> next to where, yeah, a picture of eyes is all it takes, not even just a person, uh, then people are much less likely to steal and they're much more likely to pay for the things if it's an honor system. And it works, it works really well. Nice. Okay, so last question was like privacy friendly social media. How do you advertise or market your hackerspace towards uh, your community or your not yet community in a way that is more privacy friendly as Facebook or Twitter? So that was originally your question. Like, I guess you have done some research or have you tried any things that did not work out? Not really. It it just sort of popped into my mind just now. Mm -hmm. So I, I guess one thing that wasn't intentional but has a really strong effect in Zurich was having the location at a reasonably central place, which of course, I mean, just we happen to find this place for cheap and it's much closer to the center of the city. And I think on, on the usual night, we have like twice as many people as as say three years ago when when we were more on the outskirts mm -hmm. so i don't think i'm not sure if if there really was any other significant change other than the location in what makes it attractive to come there so yeah i guess that's a large part but of course is very expensive usually sure and we, we've heard the idea of uh, advertisement in supermarkets. I find that a, r a really great idea, <laughs> even though I guess it didn't work yet for you, but I think it's worth trying. <laughs> so the supermarket thing was mainly the workshop because we thought that there are a lot of people like in the, in the local uh, city that are interested in some like technical topics but don't know anything about them. And for example, there's the Mikro Club Schule uh, that covers a lot of these topics, but not all of them. And we thought maybe some people are going to be interested. But it was an experiment. And yeah, I, I don't really know who actually reads those, those posts in the Mikro. Yeah. The other thing that I never do know. <laughs> the other thing that uh, we did was we basically are alive because we're in a village with a, a university and that's also where uh, basically the, the reason why I live there because I studied there in the past so um, we always try to get students to join we also have separate prices for student like for um, people without income and people with income uh, and uh, people for people without income it's 10 bucks per month which is uh, anybody should be able to pay that so what we did last year was we had a lightning talk session at the university where we presented different topics and projects we had. And uh, we expected maybe five people to show up. And then there were, I think, 20 or 30 and even some lecturers showed up. And it didn't have any effect on memberships, but a few people came by our hackerspace. So maybe if we do that a few times, it could work. And I could imagine that there are also other locations where you could have like um, I don't know, a free talk or um, present some topic or something uh, where you indirectly show that you have a lot of knowledge that uh, people could learn from and uh, where people might become interested to take a look at your space. Yeah, and this ties in with fundraising and publicity because they go together. Um, things that are really, really popular at Noisebridge and hackerspaces all over the world are um, how to make your own website. Arduino for total newbies, that's super popular. How to solder, that we've been doing that every Monday at Noisebridge for 10 years and there's always, um, any, 10 is the minimum number of people, that's considered really small. And sometimes there's up to 50 people. Uh, lightning talks are super popular, we do that once a month. Having some things that are really simple for total beginners be free is really helpful because it attracts a whole bunch of new people that later might come to the space and some of those might become paying members uh, or donate something. And um, uh, another thing that's popular is how to sew. Fix it cafes where people can bring their broken things and you don't fix it for them but you show them people help each other in fixing things and how to fix things. So things like that are really good to have for free 
so that it attracts people um, who will become paying members. And putting posters up is a way to do it. Um, you know, hackerspaces are averse to, and should be, um, things like Facebook, because Facebook has some serious problems. Um, but there are other social media for getting the word out that aren't so bad, like Diaspora, which is one that anyone can host on their own server. Um, of course, there aren't four billion people on Diaspora. So these are all trade-offs. How do you get the word out? Um, but yeah, putting posters up, I don't know, in Zurich uh, it might be too clean. <laughs> People don't like posters in anywhere except a supermarket. Uh, but, uh, and everyone has their own, probably has their own uh, washing machine, so there's not a laundromat. Uh, in San Francisco, putting them up all over town on posts and laundromats and supermarkets and universities and schools. Also getting... Um, uh, inviting teachers to have a field trip into the high, uh, into the hackerspace, anything from little kids in first grade all the way up through uh, university, is a great way to get new people as well. I have a question to you about uh, terminology. So I hear there are hackerspaces, there are fab labs, there are makerspaces. They're all to me, more or less the same thing. Um, maybe they're totally different, I don't know. But uh, I was looking for, for a fab lab at the place I, I recently moved to, and I didn't find any. So they're calling themselves Sandkasten. So um, I, I told them, yeah, please, somewhere on the website, mention that you're something like a fab lab. People might find you. <laughs> so <laughs> what I suggest, as, maybe to improve your publicity, put those three or four or five uh, words into your website somewhere that you're something like it. Maybe not exactly, but people might find you that way. <laughs> and there, there's also hackerspaces.org. If your space is not on hackerspaces.org, it's a wiki, it's free, just fill out the form and get yourself on there because then you will show up on any Google or DuckDuckGo or any search engine search. If you're not there, you won't show up. So, but if, if anyone types in um, Switzerland hackerspace, all the hackerspaces or makerspaces or fab labs, whatever the hell you want to call yourself, it doesn't matter as long as you have a supportive community for people to come and explore and do things that are totally cool. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. Just, but put yourself on hackerspaces.org and many more people will find you. So I told you we are in a school. It's a, um, a technical school. So people which do an apprenticeship in IT going to the school. And the positive aspect from us is some of our members are teachers part time at the school. And they make a little bit of advertisement. And we, a some of our members coming through on this way to, to our cl uh, club. And for us, this is a really good way to, to get new members. <laughs> and even if we don't have a, a teacher for, from a time period um, there, um, sometimes pe people are from our, from us are going there and asking the teacher before can we come uh, during the break and tell tell you some tell your students something about us? And this worked very well. So even if you're located uh, on other places, go to to the schools or to the university and hold some short presentations. This makes some noise. People are beginning to talk and. From time to time, someone comes up to you. Hi, I'm Steven. Um, sometimes when I travel around, I go visit some other hacker spaces or maker, maker spaces. And what I sometimes notice is that, um, I mean, when you have a website, it really helps when you have like clearly a calendar on it where people when you go to the website they see us ah, something is happening because 
a mailing list for me as a guest is not helpful. So it's always cool if you have a, something like a, a calendar. And if there is a, one particular night or day where it says like open night or like meet up or something like that, then you know as an external that you can pop in and you're welcome and you're not disturbing. So it always helps when you have a, a website that is also like not just for people who are already into it, but you know there you have a chance to jump in. So that's from my experience when I go to other spaces. I guess that's a really important point. And it also ties in with what you said with the whole soldering workshops, like this uh, low barrier of entry stuff where you, I mean, like people from outside, they don't necessarily know that they can just come to a hackerspace and that they're welcome. And like if you communicate it the right way on your website or if you do soldering course 101, Arduino for total noobs, that communicates a total other thing and that helps you probably like get more people's attention and yeah, maybe subscriptions. So you had one more? So uh, we're not really a, a hackerspace. Well, kinda, but we just meet up every week and do stuff, so we kinda are. Uh, so about just uh, enabling people to spontaneously come by, we had this idea that we, uh, once a month, we don't meet up at our usual location, uh, like it's in an industrial area of sorts, it's kinda away from the center, so that like the the step is is a bit lower for people to to just appear and say hi and and meet us but it turned out that like at our usual location we had new faces every two weeks or so it's just you, you, like people said hey yes i saw your website uh so we decided to to come and see what's what's going on here and uh, on the other hand, uh, in this restaurant where, you know, you can really just come by and have a beer and talk, it was just us most of the time. So it seems like this, uh, this uh, hurdle of, of going out there to our space and like taking the freight elevator and calling people to come in because we don't have a key system or anything, it, it, <laughs> uh, it didn't stop anyone. People, new people came more often to our regular meetings than our meet new people meetings. So yeah, let me let me just say something first. Uh, so um, the best way to do publicity is to tell everyone you meet that there's this incredibly cool thing, <laughs> and it even helps much more if you have stickers. Stickers are really cheap, and people like stickers. They put them on laptops, they put them on poles, they put them on skateboards, they put them everywhere. And um, it's really cool to see them when you're around. And it has to have your physical address and your website on it, and maybe a contact, but certainly the name and the logo and a place so they can find you. And um, <clears throat> But the best thing is to tell everyone and to tell everyone that you are totally open to everybody and you would love to have them come by if they're at all interested. And then you hand them the sticker and now they have that reminder. And when they see it, they might come. It's just uh, one thing uh, about what you said, uh, doing meeting in public places. We had our local Linux club, had uh, some tables in a bar Saturday afternoon. So they had to, they were hacking there, doing something. I was going there, tried to talk to this guy, and they, they just didn't speak. They, they, <laughs> they didn't want to talk to me, or I don't know, they didn't, they, they were so focused on their things and I didn't see the point them being there. They just were a group, isolated. And uh, I tried to stay there. I sat down on a, sh on a chair and just waited. To the <laughs> Some guys started talking to me, but I didn't get any invitations or something. Maybe, yeah, that's what you said. Just be open, talk to the people. That's, that's maybe the most important point. Just being in public doesn't help if you don't talk. <laughs> <laughs> we are all introverted geeks here. So, uh, <laughs> but that doesn't mean you can't go up to someone and just say, hey, what, do you, what kind of projects you, you play with? You know, that's a totally easy way to start a conversation with any geek. So, um, 
Yeah, it's a way to be welcoming. You know, there are also uh, websites, I don't know, different places have different ones, but that aren't tied with huge corporations. There's one in San Francisco just called sffuncheap.com. And it's just a, a place with fun and cheap stuff. And um, anyone can post things there. It's moderate, uh, uh, mediated by the, the website owner. But uh, stuff from Noisebridge is in there all the time. And it's a way that a lot of people find out about cool things at Noisebridge. OK, so I, do you have one, something to say? Or no, you, Tony? Oh, okay, because you were grabbing for the mic. So thanks everyone for like these uh, inspirational ideas on how we could tackle these three, well, in the beginning, very isolated questions, which then started to like spread out into very broad topics. Um, I would like to remind every one of you that Mitch Oldman is giving uh, soldering workshops here, so you might take part if you wish, and please do so. Um, thank you everyone who took part, had a question, gave some response, uh, it was really interesting hearing from all you guys and like seeing that this whole thing is starting to grow in Switzerland or already has grown and is already something. Yeah, thanks guys and uh, now I'm going to stop uh, bogarting the next guy's <laughs> session.